Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very accomplished professional from Chicago, USA, Bernadette Smith. Bernadette, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I am really delighted to be here. Thank you. Bernadette is the Chief Executive Officer of the Equality Institute. And she's an author. And all of you know, I am very partial to authors. She's an author of a book titled uh, Inclusive, Inclusive 360, 360. Proven Sorry. Solutions for an Equitable Organization. She's also written for other books. So uh, Bernadette, before we start talking about the Equality Institute and DEI, tell me a little bit about your own journey. Yeah, you know what? I am an entrepreneur in my heart. That is, that's a part of my identity. And mm -hmm. my parents were immigrants from Ireland and they were entrepreneurs. So I think it's just sort of in my DNA. Mm -hmm. um, I started my first business 19 years ago when I was living in Boston, Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. Ma Massachusetts at that time became the first state in the country to have marriage equality for same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. And back then I was planning events for nonprofit organizations. And I thought, you know, this law is going to pass. And there are going to be all of these couples mm -hmm. who are looking for support in planning their wedding. Someone's got to be their wedding planner. It mm. might as well be me. So mm. I decided to start a business specializing in planning weddings for these couples with a goal to really be their advocate and to help them feel safe when navigating a very traditional industry. You know, at that time, there were not a lot of business owners that were really supportive of LGBTQ couples. There were a lot of family issues, people not supporting their own kids mm. getting married. So the emotions were very heightened. There were, the fears around the weddings were very heightened. So I started that business to really uh, help those couples, again, feel safe and feel like someone had their back, someone was in their corner. As time went on, I wrote some books about that subject, started teaching and writing other people in the wedding, hospitality and travel industries. And over time, um, I just decided it was time to move on. I evolved my business away from weddings, away from those industries, and away from LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And so I retired as a wedding planner. I've been retired as a wedding planner now for probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now my business is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly. And many of our clients are corporations based here in the US. Well said. And as we were talking just before we started recording, the uh, whole thing of the LBG, LBGTQ weddings uh, in India, uh, we are hoping the law will get passed this year, or I should say sooner than later, uh, because there is a lot of acceptance now in our country. So thank you for sharing your own story. But uh, you know what? Someone's got to plan the weddings. I, Ash Ashutosh, the son, uh, you know, you, you could have a late in life <laughs> career change. I don't know if I could, but you certainly have a, an opportunity to start a branch of your business <laughs> that you gave up. Uh, but let me talk about the Equality Institute. Tell me a little bit about what was your motivation to start this one? My motivation was really about supporting people who were customers and clients. Mm. Because I had been so focused on service in the hospitality industry and in the wedding industry, and what's the experience of the customer, the client, the couple, mm. that was really sort of my focus when I started to evolve my business into other industries is what's the guest experience like? What's the client and customer experience like? Mm. And what I found is that a lot of companies do not train their employees that interact with their customers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't train them on issues like diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so actually in many cases, the frontline employee is the representative of the brand, mm -hmm. yet they also don't get training on how to be inclusive. And also, you know, that's where there, there's a risk of some big mistakes being made that can be in the public. And we've seen examples of things going viral of, videos being taken of a store clerk, you know, doing whatever not or not doing whatever, mm -hmm. not being uh, inclusive at all. And so that was really my vision when I evolved my business was to train those types of employees and really kind of build a business around that. But what I realized is that a lot of companies don't want to invest in that. Mm -hmm. So I had to sort of figure stuff out. And really, my business is focused on 
helping all employees, not just frontline employees, although I do have a soft spot for frontline employees, but helping all employees understand how to create spaces where everyone can feel safe to be authentically themselves, including them, because we're going to do our best work. We're going to move through the world with dignity, dignity. We are going to be kind to others when people are kind to us. I mean, these concepts are not uh, rocket science, are they? Absolutely. So moving on now, let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What got you interested in this area? Well, I, you know, I fall into this category, essentially. You know, I came out as a lesbian, my goodness, probably over, certainly over 20 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, it's personal. And it's also a spiritual thing mm -hmm. as I, as I've continued to learn, as I've grown older is that it's also just about our common humanity mm. and being aware that we need to give everyone a fair shot to succeed. Mm. And that means keeping in mind their individual circumstances, their individual backgrounds, whatever they have to bring to the table, mm. everyone deserves a fair shot. And there are an awful lot of systems in place that prevent that from being the reality. And so I'm really passionate about this because to me, it just speaks to my own sense of common humanity and spirituality. And mm -hmm. honestly, it, it goes really deep. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's about the, um, the principles that I think go across all religions, the common, absolutely the common principles. And, and so that, that's a big part of it for me, especially mm -hmm. as I get older. Well said. And based on all the work that you are doing, what are some of the inequity challenges a lot of women and minority leaders face? Well, the obvious things is that that there are a lot of unconscious biases built into the way we operate. Mm -hmm. And so when we have systems, for example, hiring and promotions, mm -hmm. committee assignments that are assigned or people are hired or promoted, without a lot of structure to that process, mm -hmm. when there's not a lot of structure to the process, then there's room for bias. And by bias, I mean that folks tend to offer opportunities to stretch assignments to promotions to referrals to people who are like us. Because it's just the way our brain is wired for comfort and familiarity for safety, our, our brain subconsciously believes that people who are like us are more familiar, mm -hmm. more comfortable, which must mean that they're more safe. And so our brain is sort of wired to go to safety first. Mm -hmm. And so that's sometimes, and of course that's sort of the, the way it was back in the day of hunters and gatherers. But even now we have to be really intentional about being inclusive because generally we will default to being exclusive. And so for folks who are from underrepresented groups, women and, and, and other folks who are historically marginalized, you know, they're not always getting a fair shot because we tend to default to what's familiar, safe, what's been done before. And so that's why in a lot of leadership roles in organizations around the world, mm -hmm. there are a very high percentage of straight white men who've given opportunities to people like them and sort of sort of the cycle perpetuates. Well said. And, you know, there is a lot of talk about inclusion, you know, especially after the SDGs came out, etc. I wanted to get your perspective on how much is actually being achieved. <laughs> well, you know what? I think that there are a lot of people with really good intentions but progress is slow, mm. especially because a few years ago when we started having racial justice uprisings here in the US and there were a lot of commitments and pledges made by corporations to do better, um, you know, there were high expectations mm. and a lot of the companies that started doing things right away were holding things like workshops and listening sessions, but not necessarily looking to make holistic, strategic, systemic change. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a change management initiative. It's not about training. It goes a lot deeper than that. And it really should touch all of the different functions of an organization. Mm -hmm. 
And that's actually the concept of my book, Inclusive 360, is looking at diversity, not just in terms of hiring or other HR process, mm -hmm. but also looking at it in terms of marketing and product development and speaking and meetings and events and, you know, all of the different functions that an organization has, mm -hmm. there are opportunities to be inclusive. Amazing. So I think that there, uh, I, I have certainly identified the opportunities, <laughs> but I think that progress is slow. That's and it. I think that we need to give it, give it some grace because it is about change and humans are resistant to change. So I like to celebrate progress. I agree. You know, I was speaking to, I've spoken to several women leaders and I've asked them, I said, you are included in the boardroom around the board table, but do you have a voice? And uh, I'm, I was pained to learn that majority of them said we are included, but we don't have the voice that we seek, which is unfortunate, but uh, I'm sure we'll get there. My next question to you is that uh, in an organization, where does accountability lie for uh, inclusion? Because when I spoke to see some CEOs, I said, do you have a, a DEI policy? They said, yes, now the CHRO is implementing it. I love, I love that. that. Yeah, that's really common, actually. And I, I mean, I'm glad that you said that because what I believe is that DEI should not be part of HR mm. simply because of what I said before. I mean, it falls into meetings and events. It falls into product development. It, it's yeah. part of marketing and communications. It's part mm. of everything. Procurement. Who do we buy from? Who are our suppliers? And so when we're lumping it in with HR, we're missing the full picture. Mm. And I think we're diluting the message a bit. Mm. What I believe is that when we're giving DEI a holistic approach and we're looking at it across an entire organization's functions, every person in leadership should have some level of accountability. Right. So that could mean they're accountable for the number of folks on their team, the number of direct reports who are attending a work, an optional workshop, mm -hmm. you know, how are you voluntolling mm -hmm. <laughs> telling people to attend, you know, it might be optional, but how are you encouraging the folks on your team to attend or as a, as a leader, how many folks from underrepresented groups have you been hiring this month or promoting mm. or how many have left the company? Like those are types of metrics that we can actually look at. Of course, those are HR, mm. um, but there are lots of ways that we can hold leaders at every level accountable. Mm. But my favorite story about this actually comes from MasterCard mm -hmm. because MasterCard actually incentivizes every single employee mm. to care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they do that by tying employee bonuses to ESG goals. So that's environmental, social, and governance goals. Yeah. So every single employee mm. has some skin in the game. Amazing. Amazing. My next question to you is on, on culture. Um, you know, different cultures from around the world handle diversity, equity, and inclusion very differently. You are in probably one of the most culturally diverse countries in the world. I want to get your perspective on how does culture impact DEI? Well, I think it's intertwined. I mean, I think culture ultimately is about the people and the, the climate of an organization or of a community of any kind. And that, that climate and culture is defined by the experiences of people. And we're not going to have the most vibrant, rich, and dynamic culture mm -hmm. if people feel excluded. Mm -hmm. So in order to really maximize the potential of that culture and the potential of all of the diversity that's coming together, mm -hmm. we really need to create a space where every voice matters, where people who are different from us have a seat at the table and as you were saying in the boardroom, right, that their voice is actually listened to and, and valued. And so when we're looking to create spaces of inclusion where fo folks do feel like their voice matters, mm. then we can have a more vibrant and connective culture. So there's a really close relationship there. But on the other hand, if we have an organization or an organizational culture in which folks are not 
seeing other people like them or they have a manager or a leader that doesn't really seem to care about diversity or look to understand them more as a human as opposed to a uh, a robot typing at their desk right mm -hmm. i think when we start to see the humanity of each individual then that's how we can start to build inclusion but a, a lot of times folks are just focused on their role and their job and they don't bring the rest of who they are to work and that means that I think the culture is missing out on their potential because these are people who might not be sharing their big ideas even. Mm -hmm. They're not feeling like they can express who they are, then they're probably not going to express their big ideas. They're probably not going to speak up if they see mistakes. Because if you speak up about one part of your life, you're probably going to be more likely to speak up about other things as well. Very interesting. So one more question uh, uh, relating to DEI, and then I'll move to your book. Uh, this is now the age of the younger leaders, the millennials, the Gen Zs, and I'm from the boomers generation. I wanted to get your perspective, Bernadette, on how you see millennials and Gen Z leaders. So I think I brought a breath of fresh air into most organizations. How are they changing diversity, equity, and inclusion? They are making the rest of us pay attention. Mm -hmm. They are holding our feet to the fire. They are the ones that are holding us accountable. They are the ones that are more likely to be at those Black Lives Matter rallies and protests. And they are more likely to be the ones that are unionizing. So it's something that is about the, the pressure that they're applying mm -hmm. towards greater occlusion and, uh, inclusion and equality. Mm -hmm. These are folks whose generations themselves are naturally more diverse, especially Gen Z. And so this is something that's fairly normal to them. And so when they're going into a work environment and they're not seeing diversity and they're not feeling like they can fully express themselves, well, you know, they're going to rebel <laughs> and they're going to ask for what they need because they are, gener they are generations that have been give given permission to express themselves and ask for what they want, as opposed to my generation in which I was basically told children should be seen and not heard. <laughs> And then if you look at my generation, children were automatically not, not even seen, not even heard, you know, so. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the way we have been raising children differently over the generations, I think, is having a direct impact on how they speak up at work and what their expectations are. Very interesting. So I'm not going to move to your book, um, Inclusive 360, Proven Solutions for an Equitable Organization. Before I start ask you about the book, I'm assuming it's available on Amazon. Yes. It is. So I'm asking all our viewers and listeners to go and check out Bernadette Smith's book, Inclusive 360, and I'm going to check it out myself. Uh, tell me a little bit about your book and your hypothesis to write it. My hypothesis behind the book is that there are a whole lot of really well-meaning people who want to do the right thing to create more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organizations. Mm -hmm. They do. But for a lot of folks, especially people who are my age, my generation and older, it's kind of a big concept and they're not really sure how to get started. They're not really sure how they fit into the picture of all of this. Mm -hmm. And so the book is very tactical. It has literally strategies for every function. It talks mm -hmm. about what you can do if you work in procurement, what you can do in the various HR processes to create more equitable so systems what you can do to make more add more structure to your hiring process to reduce the risk of bias mm -hmm. like very very specific strategies mm -hmm. and so it's a i mean there are certainly dozens of examples and from companies from corporations that are actually doing things right so there are examples ripped from the headlines that people can be inspired by and test out and experiment within their own organization mm -hmm. because what i'm afraid of and what i've seen happen is that a lot of folks get really overwhelmed and they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And so they just sign up for another workshop mm -hmm. and that does not move the needle in any significant way. Mm -hmm. And so really this is about going beyond workshops and going beyond training leadership development and looking at systems change and how everyone has a role to play in it. Mm, interesting. You also talk about the proven solutions for an equitable organization. Tell me what these solutions are. 
Well, an example came from, I, I gave earlier about what MasterCard is doing, right? Mm -hmm. How they're holding all of their employees are accountable or giving all of their employees bonuses based on ESG goals. Mm -hmm. But I'm just looking at, you know, page 48 from my book mm -hmm. is about hiring. And so as an example here, a proven solution is about an investment firm called Capital Group, mm -hmm. which for their internship class is no longer looking at resumes. Mm -hmm. so their hiring managers are told are given some great questions to ask, mm -hmm. but the can the candidates are prepared that the hiring managers don't see the resumes, but the hiring managers are told to focus on the experience and the background mm -hmm. because there's a lot of bias built into resumes. So where did that, where did that, that person go to college? Oh, I grew up in that town. You know, there's a lot of things that we can pick up from resumes that are about familiarity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ditching resumes and is in another example. Um, another example in the book is from Unilever, which is a, a, a big global company, and how they made a public commitment to have all of their 14,000 managers around the globe, well, about half of them, be women. Mm. And they set that goal for 2021, and they achieved it a year early. Yes. So how did they achieve that? How did they promote more women? How did they hire more women to be managers? There are some examples about how they did that in this book as well. Mm. So. Yeah. It's very, very tactical. Fascinating. Well, I look forward to reading this. And Bernard, my last question to you, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation, based on your own amazing journey and all the learnings that you've had, first from being a wedding planner to now being a DEI guru, what would you say are three lessons that you would want our viewers and listeners to take away? One thing which is I, I think is just really simple is that we ought to be more curious about people who are different from us. Yeah. And not nosy, mm -hmm. not pushy, mm -hmm. but just genuinely curious. Yeah. And a way to approach someone who's different from us is to just ask a question. And it yeah. might mean that we are sharing a little bit about ourselves first. Yeah. But but simply asking a question respecting whatever you hear and then looking to reconnect and, and do it over and over again and just ask, respect and connect. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing. Um, another key takeaway is what you mentioned earlier, diversity, equity and inclusion should not be an HR initiative. It should mm -hmm. be something that is uh, distributed and part of every function of an organization. It should yeah. be baked and embedded into all of the functions. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my second takeaway. And my third takeaway is to just really know that you, no matter where you are and what you do within your organization, you have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And it can be very easy to stick with the status quo and stick with what's comfortable, but you actually have a role to play. And it's not, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. It's it, in, in many cases, this does come down to our common humanity and mm -hmm. And I think that there's something for all of us in this conversation. And a lot of folks feel excluded by the DEI conversation because they don't understand that diversity means everyone. And okay. I really do believe that we are all diverse just okay. sort of Absolutely. by that definition, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. And on that note, Bernadette, and your three amazing lessons, be more curious about the people who are different and this applies uh, in every way possible with everyone who is different. Second, you said when it comes to diversity and diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is not an HR initiative. It is something which is each one of us in every organization needs to be able to work towards. And third one, which is so powerful, each one of us has a role to play in making sure DEI, DEI is something which gets accomplished in society as a whole. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your own journey, about uh, the Equality Institute, about all the work that you've been doing in the area of DEI, and finally for about about your book, author about three inclusive three hundred and sixty proven solutions for an equitable organization. Thank you for speaking to me, and good luck. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals.
You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.